Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Matthew Feeney. Joining us today is Brink Lindsay, formerly of the Cato Institute, now Vice President and Director of the Open Society Project at the Niskanen Center, and Stephen M. Tellis, Associate Professor of Political Science at the Johns Hopkins University and Senior Fellow at the Niskanen Center. Together, they are the authors of The Captured Economy, How the Powerful Enrich Themselves, Slow Down Growth, and Increase Inequality. Welcome to Free Thoughts, gentlemen. Trevor, Matthew, great to be back. Thanks for having us on. So what's wrong with the U.S. economy? Over the course of the 21st century, the U.S. economy has been experiencing a double whammy of slow growth and high inequality. Uh, as to growth, the growth rate uh, so far in the 21st century has averaged about 1% a year uh, in terms of real uh, GDP or gross domestic product per capita. Uh, that's half the rate that was the average rate of uh, economic growth during the 20th century. Uh, meanwhile, uh, with rising uh, inequality, the growth rate uh, overstates the degree of uh, material improvement for most Americans uh, because most of the gains from growth or a disproportionate share of the gains from growth are going to a relatively narrow slice at the top. Uh, so when you put those two things together, uh, you get to the point where on election night 2016, only 30% of Americans said that they expected their kids to be better off uh, than they are. Do you know how that compares to other eras? Uh, much lower. Much lower. Yes. Um, so uh, when you're in those kind of uh, situation, you get uh, you get political uh, repercussions that I think we are living through right now. Yeah, and I think the main argument we have in the book is that this is not just a purely economic phenomenon. It's not a natural consequence, say, of uh, increasing globalization or uh, changes in the human capital necessities of firms, that this is an explicitly political phenomenon and it's a result of actual change in regulatory and other governing policies. And therefore, we have to think about this as a political economic problem and not just a natural product of market forces. Not not entirely a product. So we, yes. we think that uh, – these uh, uh, developments of slow growth and high inequality have, uh, are incredibly complex phenomena with many different causes. We're not claiming that uh, we've got some monocausal explanation of everything that's going wrong. Uh, but what we are claiming is that an important aspect of what's going wrong uh, has been underreported, underappreciated, and that is the degree to which government policies are actively making matters worth on, worse on both fronts. Now, a lot of people would say that the economy is rigged. I mean, it's kind of a common position. Occupy Wall Street and Trump voters. Uh, what in what way would they both be correct, or so that if something is rigged? Well, I think the big argument we have in the book is that when people talk about rigged, they often talk about it in a very casual way. Um, it's over. It's both over and under inclusive. Um, uh, people also ideologically cherry pick which part they uh, claim is rigged. So obviously, obviously Occupy Wall Street uh, po focused a lot on finance, which is an important part of the story. Often conservatives don't pay as much attention to that um, as they ought to. Uh, but people on the left ignore, uh, at least until recently, um, changes and constraints in the housing market. They ignore increases in occupational uh, licensing. For the most part, they've been uninterested in intellectual property. Uh, and what we, uh, what we argue is that this is a sort of comprehensive problem, and it goes even beyond the cases we study in the book. We could actually get, uh, get into that in more detail. In some sense, we're just scra uh, scratching the surface. Oh, we're looking at the ones that seem to have the biggest impact, both on uh, innovation and therefore growth and inequality simultaneously. So maybe it's uh, my my inherent pessimism that does prompt me to ask the question. But given that there seem to be problems with how the left and the right are assessing the problems, is there any viable political uh, solution to the problems that you outline at the moment? Well, when you extrapolate from current trends, you almost always get into trouble uh, predicting the future. Uh, there's usually some kind of negative feedback, and when things get really lousy, uh, and it seems like uh, that that's just the course that we're on, and things are going to go down, down, down. Uh, lo and behold, some negative feedback mechanisms kick in, uh, and things uh, go off in a different tack. I know I lived through the 1970s where. Everybody was completely convinced everything was going downhill. Uh, and then, uh, voila, we had lots of uh, important uh, economic and political reforms, and uh, we had a period of uh, economic revival and uh, rejuvenation. So things uh, are frequently uh, – well, the, the smart money is always that big important changes are completely impossible until the very moment in which they happen. Uh, so uh, what we have to do is uh, we, we recognize that there is great frustration on uh, throughout the political spectrum with both established parties, with established institutions. 
Americans. Uh, that creates a hunger for for some. Uh, it creates a vulnerability to demagoguery and uh, to to a breakdown of institutions. It also creates a, a, a possibility for openness to uh, to real reforms that uh, uh, that can make a positive difference. So we interpret the populist mood now charitably that there is a real signal there uh, that uh, people are treading water or are falling underneath while they see people at the very top uh, doing lots of self-dealing. Uh, and even if they misdirect their anger, uh, the anger reflects something real. Uh, and if we uh, can direct that towards uh, policy changes that will actually address the underlying problems, uh, then uh, we can make something good out of this mess. Right. And one of the things we argue in the, uh, in the book, especially in the last couple of chapters, is that um, you can be too pessimistic. Um, the Especially public choice economics, which is very popular around here, uh, leads you almost inevitably into pessimism. Uh, and we uh, draw on some of that, but try and go beyond it, I think, in some important ways. Uh, the public choice argument for pessimism is that almost all this rent seeking is driven by the difference between the concentrated interests of those who are seeking to get uh, various different kinds of government benefits and the diffuse uh, nature of all the people who are paying for them. Uh, and if that's all you think is going on, if you think basically politi a political system is a neutral environment in which uh, concentrated versus diffuse interests play out, you uh, have a hard time coming up with anything other than a pessimistic story. But we don't think that's all that's going on. Uh, we have political institutions and political institutions in some important ways mediate or uh, exacerbate uh, that underlying basic public choice problem, and one, I think, in, of the maybe counterintuitive uh, arguments we make in the book is that you may need to increase government capacity, the number of people who are actually uh, producing information, um, in particular about these various different regulatory schemes. Government needs to invest more in that in some ways to prevent it from being exploited by concentrated interests, and concentrated interests get their way not just because they have more muscle, but they have more resources to invest in information. And so um, while organizations like Cato and other kinds of things are very important for bringing uh, information to policymakers that's different than what concentrated interests have, the information that government produces internally is just as important, and that information has become systematically dismantled over the last 30 years. Now, before we get to the, the actual case studies you kind of do or the topics, the four topics, I, th I find it interesting that if someone were looking at your book and let's say an Occupy Wall Street person and then they could walk past and they say, oh, this this looks exactly like what I believe. Um, and they, may, they might notice, though, that it doesn't say how the rich enrich themselves or like the, it, it just says the powerful. So what's the difference between the rich and the powerful? So uh, rent seeking uh, by definition uh, is bad economic policy. It's pursuing uh, profits through the political process through favorable rules rather than through adding value for customers. Uh, so in terms of its implications for economic efficiency and growth, it's uh, rent seeking definitionally is negative. Its distributional consequences though are ambiguous. Uh, democracy is uh, so by by just by the nature of things, uh, rent seeking favors the powerful. Uh, powerful power is just the capacity to get your way in the political process. Uh, but the powerful aren't necessarily the rich. They frequently are, but they aren't always. Uh, we saw in the in the early decades of modern activist government in the New Deal era, uh, lots of of rent. Uh, creating policies uh, that were trying to do downward or sideways redistribution, uh, downward redistribution in terms of labor legislation, minimum wage laws, rent control, universal service requirements, all kinds of things. Sideways redistribution, even when uh, when uh, government policies uh, subsidized big business, those big businesses typically had large semi-skilled unionized workforces, so the rents that went to the businesses were shared with the workers. Uh, what we have noted is that in recent decades, a lot of that kind of downward inside Sideways uh, redistributing rent seeking got cleared out by the economic deregulation of the 1970s. Uh, but uh, what has been growing up in recent decades has been regressive rent seeking, rent seeking that uh, that uh, slows down growth, uh, stymies dynamism, um, but does so in a way that redistributes income and wealth up the uh, ladder. Why the difference between uh, the old ways and the new ways? We're not 100% uh, sure. We don't uh, we don't put forward a theory that we're uh, that uh, that uh, we're uh, confident. In. Uh, but clearly, the disappearance or relative or decline of unions, the decline of their political power, has meant a decline in political and forceful political actors trying to rig regulations in a downward redistributing way. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, the changing 
uh, employment profile of America's leading industries is, I think, a, a major part of the story. Uh, now, the industries at the vanguard of technological progress, and therefore the ones that are most likely to be uh, uh, the focus of government policy because they're important, uh, tend to employ uh, disproportionately highly skilled workers. And so if you subsidize them, uh, the rents don't get shared very widely. So right. put those things together and you get a very different, uh, a clear distributional uh, impact of, of rent seeking today in a way that's uh, different from uh, the earlier era. Yeah, I mean, there's two policy regimes that may be uh, useful for making this kind of concrete. Uh, one, you can think in terms of finance. Um, go back and think about the way that we regulated uh, banking for the most part uh, up until the early 1990s. Um, what we basically had is a whole bunch of savings and loans um, that had geographically cartelized markets, um, often very small savings and loans, like in the little tiny town my mom grew up. It had its own savings and loan, Lake City, uh, South Carolina savings and loan. Um, and so that uh, regime, which had lots of inefficiencies and problems with it, yeah, but it, it, had, it, it but kind it, of collapsed. Right, but, it, well, but it had a particular distributive effect, which was to create thousands and thousands of small bankers who could afford country club fees in small towns. Right, that was the main effect. Right, it gave it created a you know a lot of upper middle class um, uh, kind of people. Um, when that collapsed in the uh, late eighties and early nineties, with the uh, savings and loan uh, blow up. The uh, thing that replaced it was mortgage securitization, right? Um, and mortgage securitization had a very different distributive profile, right? It was mortgage or originators and uh, mortgage bond traders. And that tends to be um, a smaller but a much higher uh, income uh, group, right? So that's those are just two uh, examples of um, the distributive effects of two different regulatory regimes. The other one you might want to think about is the difference between unionization and occupational licensing. There's been great work done by Morris Kleiner that we rely on a lot in the book. Um, and just as unionization has been going down, occupational licensing has been going up. Now, I don't think those two things are com causally connected, um, but they're two different labor market regulation regimes. Uh, unionization generally had the effect of wage compression, um, whereas occupational licensing doesn't seem to have any wage compression effect, and in some other areas, arguably, it ends up protecting uh, the incomes of high earners. So again, if you think about what we're talking in the book, we're talking about a sort of regime shift in regulation from at least a sideways or downward uh, regulation, regulatory regime, to one that is at least is neutral or upward redistributing. And yeah, just one addendum on occupational licensing. Uh, it tends to uh, increase the uh, the incomes of all incumbent service providers, uh, but the income boosting effect is highest at the high end. Uh, so the overall net effect of uh, the explosion of occupational licensing has been to to uh, exacerbate income dispersion and, and particularly uh, high incomes at the very top. Uh, so doctors and lawyers, both beneficiaries of occupational licensing, between them make up 25 percent of the top one percent. And I imagine that another part of the distribution is the saving is loan bank executive who could go to the country club in South Carolina, uh, th they're all in New York now. The, the, all yeah. those rents went to the well-heeled 1%, even the you, yeah, I think right, you right. say I mean, that 14% of the 1% is financial yeah, and 18% I mean, of the 0.1% is financial right. and they're probably all in New York. Yeah, and, and literally the, one of the reasons for the old regulatory regime is that we had a geographic structure of representation in Congress. Uh, and people from places like South Carolina had a lot of power on banking committee and things like that. And that's, you know, the whole Glass-Steagall regime, again, which we make, make clear, had lots and lots of problems. Um, but it was designed to geographically cartelize and disperse the market in a way that the secu mortgage securitization regime does not. So uh, I guess the obvious question when you discuss occupational uh, licensing is um, what, what's what's the, the solution to this? So you mentioned doctors and lawyers. Should there be no licenses for uh, doctors and lawyers? How many uh, occupations should be exempt from this kind of regime? So uh, the alternative to uh, licensure is certification, uh, which can be done. Uh, so the, the, the point of licensing, the justification for licensing is consumer protection. You want to protect uh, consumers from information asymmetries where they can't tell who who uh, are the quality providers and who are the quacks, the fly-by-night operators, and uh, uh, so forth. Um, but in fact, uh, there's uh, precious little evidence uh, that this consumer uh, protection uh, 
actually is occurring. Uh, what really is occurring is simply uh, supply constriction and uh, income inflation for incumbent service providers in a way that doesn't really uh, translate into better service for customers. Um, so uh, that information asymmetry uh, problem can be addressed through voluntary certification. Uh, through uh, private actors like underwriters' laboratories or the good housekeeping seal of approval or consumer reports or through government certification. This, we have the government seal of approval. We are a, a government certified uh, you know, uh, doctor or lawyer. Uh, but uh, you don't have to then uh, – proscribe legally uh, economic transactions between uh, unlicensed professionals and willing customers. That seems pretty radical. Right. Well, and well, the, the important point here, though, is that um, it's not so much the public versus private distinction that matters here. It's whether or not there's a barrier to entry or not. Um, and that also affects the competitive nature of the regulatory regime, right? So if we have a state of North Carolina has a certification regime for dentists, um, if it gets too extreme, um, then people are gonna simply going to opt out, and the regulatory agent is going to know that. They're, the people who are making the regulations know they have some competitive pressure to set their regulations at something like a reasonable level because otherwise people are going to opt out or they're going to opt into a private certification regime. And so the important point, I think, in the book is simply that it's a good idea to not accept in extreme cases create a uh, formal barrier to entry, um, whether that should be public or private. In some of these cases, you could have competition uh, between a public and a private uh, certification regime. A, a public certification regime is almost by definition not going to be a monopoly in a way that a licensure uh, regime is. I think it's worthwhile since it's actually so counterintuitive to go ahead and grasp the nettle and talk a little bit about medical licensing because that's the one case where everybody says, but of course you have to have. And there was a recent Supreme Court case uh, on uh, on occupational licensing and there was a little colloquy between uh, between Justices uh, Scalia and uh, – I think Breyer. I think Breyer uh, where they were both saying, but of course we would want uh, – you know, we don't want uh, – we, we need licensing for brain surgeons. We want brain surgeons to be able to pick and choose who the appropriate people are to do brain surgery. Uh, so that, that all sounds very commonsensical, except it doesn't have anything to do with actual legal reality. There is no licensing for brain surgeons or for any other specialties. There is only licensing for general practitioners. So the state licenses are given to anyone who completes a U.S. residency in anything and who completes a state medical licensing exam and, and passes. So if you complete a U.S. residency in podiatry and pass a state licensing exam, then in that state, you are legally entitled to do brain surgery or heart transplants or whatever you can convince people to do. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, of course, that doesn't happen. Yeah, I know, uh, a podiatrist, so what, yeah. brain surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so why doesn't that happen? Uh, because no practice group would hire a podiatrist to do brain surgery. No hospital would uh, grant uh, uh, admitting or surgical privileges to that person. Why won't they? Uh, first, because they want to serve their customers well. And second, because they are worried about uh, li uh, liability for medical malpractice. So normal commercial and liability incentives actually, uh, actually do constrain uh, – who gets to do brain surgery in a way that licensing doesn't at all. Uh, so, and three quarters of American doctors, 70% to three quarters of American doctors are specialists, uh, not GPs, which means that their practice of medicine is unlicensed. Uh, they, are, they may be board certified, but those, uh, those certification boards are private boards and that cer certification is voluntary. Uh, meanwhile, doctors uh, practice for decades uh, and uh, medical practice changes dramatically uh, over the course of their careers and yet licensing is done at one time. It's done at the advent of your career. So uh, there's this check then, but uh, as uh, the practice of medicine completely changes, uh, there's no uh, recheck. Uh, there is theoretically the possibility of delicensing uh, for bad actors, uh, but it is notoriously lax uh, and almost always has to do with uh, handing out uh, uh, the wrong drugs to people or, or sexual misconduct with patients in many states. Incompetence isn't even a grounds uh, for uh, for uh, removing a license. So, uh, in reality, uh, licensing doesn't do what it says, uh, and uh, and private mechanisms and the background of of private uh, law uh, uh, actually do the work. Right, and the um, when we think about licensing of doctors, people usually talk about it as if the thing that consumers are being protected against 
is a quack doctor, right? There's a quack doctor out there, and we need to protect them from being, being treated with them. And in fact, in most cases, what licensing is doing is preventing you from being treated by a registered nurse, right, or some other medical professional. And this has a huge actual effect on the way we organize medical care, right? One way to think about what a licensing regime does is it means there's a very limited kinds of way that you can organize medical practice. So it's, uh, in many states, it's very hard to create uh, minute clinics or other kinds of things that, uh, that deal with lots of, uh, of treatments for which almost nobody really needs a doctor. Um, often those, those places uh, say, you, you know, even if all you're doing is immunizations or you know, uh, putting a splint on somebody's finger, that there still has to be a doctor around. And that doctor around uh, massively increases the cost and mainly, though, uh, prevents innovation. And that's the, uh, the argument in the book is um, that innovation effect uh, is very, very important in lots of these cases because r- growth often comes not just from huge new inventions, but huge new ways of organizing um, different kinds of uh, industries. And occupational licensing tends to, through scope of practice kind of rules, tends to uh, take those ways of organizing and cement them in place. So just as a, just as a sort of hypothetical imagination, Imagine if uh, computer programming were subject to occupational licensing and, and the regime had started back in the 50s or 60s. <laughs> you can imagine the licensing exams today would include punch card maintenance and, uh, and all kinds Fortran. Of, yes. and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so when, when we're talking about a, a slowdown in innovation, I suppose my, my, my question is, uh, how, how is this being measured? Uh, because you, you could make the argument, look, in the last couple of decades, American companies, we've got Google, we've got Facebook, we've got uh, these innovative, cool new companies. Uh, students from all over the world come here to learn uh, science and to get higher level degrees. So what are, the, what are the signs that we're actually slowing down in innovation? So the, the metrics are uh, all... Uh, problematic uh, because it's difficult to measure these things statistically. But first off, we have the growth rate. The overall economy is growing half the speed it was during the 20th century. uh, And that is uh, fed. So uh, growth rate is fed both by growth in inputs and by growth in productivity. Uh, uh, And we have not only had uh, a slowdown in growth in inputs, like slowdown in population growth, uh, but also a a slowdown in productivity growth. So productivity growth since the 1970s has been very low relative to the uh, uh, the decades previous. Uh, there was one decade in the 90s uh, where uh, productivity growth zoomed back up again, uh, but it has uh, subsided once again and is at very low levels today. There are all kinds of questions about whether we're measuring that correctly, uh, but uh, even if we're measuring it uh, incorrectly, it, there's no good reason to think that we're that the measurement errors are getting worse over time. So even if productivity growth absolute values are, are, are unreliable, the trends seem like they should be paid attention to and the trends are downward. Meanwhile, there's lots of other evidence of declining uh, economic dynamism. Uh, the uh, rate at which new businesses are being created is down. The rate at which new businesses are growing is down, not just down in the last few years, but down steadily over the past several decades. So there does seem to be uh, lots of circumstantial evidence. It's smoke, not fire, but there's lots of smoke uh, that suggests that the sort of the U.S. economy is losing its its Schumpeterian mojo, uh, that the creative destruction, the churn of new businesses uh, coming in and old businesses going out is slowing down. Right. And one way to think about where uh, where growth comes from is it's over how much of the extent of the overall economy can innovation occur, right? So when you were saying, oh, there's all this innovation, these new firms, right? But they're occurring in one slice of the economy. Um, and that means that whatever growth or innovation we've got, we've got has to occur in that slice of the economy. So I was talking to somebody yesterday um, about one area in which you could see enormous innovation, which is um, accessory units for houses, right? So lots of people have, you know, three in America have three quarter acre lots. It'd be easy to put an accessory building, uh, put a student, put your grandmother, put anybody back there. And you could imagine enormous innovation in basically making those into, um, uh, you know, machine built things where you could put them up in two days. You'd pour your uh, your foundation one day. You'd go and you'd staple all the pieces together, and you'd have an accessory unit, right? A tiny um, house movement. The tiny yeah. house, and there are people doing tiny houses, but the um, industrialization of it, which is what the thing that would really produce enormous both um, opportunity for people to move into existing places, right, and a whole new industry, is basically blocked by the fact that so many jurisdictions have extraordinary rules against 
finance accessory um, uh, development, right? And so that and that means that that's an area of the economy in which you could have lots of innovation, you could ha- could have lots of growth, but you don't. Um, and you see that in lots of other areas. We talked about uh, about medicine, right? You can imagine all the business model innovation that could be going on. People who are thinking about doing something cool and new, right? Could be thinking, oh, we could go into medical practice and be doing all kinds of uh, things in uh, that area. But often they're simply not going in at all because they think, oh, do I, do I want to deal with a headache and uncertainty that's going to be associated with that? Um, so when you, again, when you look at the things you were talking about, um, that's a good area of sort of the clustering or crowding in of innovative capacity into one segment and more or less leaving the rest of it alone. So how much does uh, intellectual property um, play a role in this hampering of innovation? Is this uh, a so we, culprit? I think we've now sort of, other than intellectual property, we've mentioned the other three case studies, but we, we, we address four case studies in the book, financial regulation, intellectual property, occupational licensing and zoning, or land use regulation. On intellectual property, uh, this is uh, seems uh, at first blush surprising to include here uh, in something that's bad for growth because the whole uh, I, uh, the idea behind intellectual property is to encourage uh, growth by by encouraging uh, artistic expression, encouraging innovation through uh, increasing the returns uh, to innovation. Uh, you do that increase by granting temporary monopoly temporary monopolies to artists and to inventors through copyrights and patents. Uh, that increases their returns and therefore incentivizes them, supposedly, uh, to produce more. Um, uh, and there is something to that uh, to that argument, uh, but uh, there are also costs uh, as well as benefits associated with intellectual property. We tend to think of the costs all being on the consumer side, that this is kind of a trade-off between benefits for innovators versus extra uh, pri- higher prices for consumers. So uh, consumers need to pay a little bit more now so that they can have better products down the line. Uh, but there's another trade-off as well. It's between what we could call upstream innovators and downstream innovators. Uh, so upstream innovators, who, when they get their patents, uh, are uh, advantaged thereby. But downstream innovators who need access to upstream ideas to put together and recombine some new innovative gadget, uh, then have their access to those upstream ideas uh, blocked uh, or hindered uh, by patent protection. And so with the explosion uh, in, uh, in patents in recent decades, and uh, these days, uh, every year, the patent office issues about five times as many patents as it did 30 years ago, uh, then we've had this sort of growth of a legal minefield for uh, innovators so that when they have a new product, uh, they have uh, it's almost impossible to do the due diligence to find out whether they're infringing. And so uh, they have to wait for a shakedown call from somebody. And even if it's not a good claim, uh, there's going to be legal costs. So uh, it really puts, uh, it really puts uh, many innovators in a bind. Uh, these days, uh, so the, the classic image of the of the lone inventor battling the big bad corporation who's stolen his uh, his uh, invention uh, that just doesn't describe reality. Uh, the uh, vast majority of of uh, patent uh, claims are against uh, are, do not allege copying. Uh, they just allege independent co-invention, but too late to have gotten the patent, and so you lose. Um, meanwhile. The majority of uh, patents uh, infringement cases now are brought by uh, so-called patent trolls, uh, or uh, uh, they have other uh, nicer euphemistic names. <laughs> but basically, they're entities that exist to buy up portfolios of patents, to weaponize them, to turn them into to, to litigate on them, and to make money from them. Uh, so, so now you have the majority of patent infringement cases are brought by people who make nothing, uh, and they're brought against innovators uh, for in- incidental or uh, unintentional infringement. Uh, and uh, unsurprisingly, there's lots of evidence that this is uh, not good for innovation. Right, and this has on the effect on innovation is also has a, probably has a concentration effect. Um, that is, where there's that degree of uncertainty, that uncertainty could be um, completely debilitating for a small or new firm. Um, and that's why we've seen this sort of slowdown in, um, in IPOs and that, that whole part of the process of new firm formation and innovation seems to be breaking down. And there's some reason to think that that's connected to the, uh, the uncertainty and high costs that are associated with the IP regime. The other thing that I think is really important, and, uh, and it's remarkable how few people have recognized this or how little it is, just how much our um, IP regime has changed, right? So this isn't a case where, um, you know, the, uh, we have a, an old, you know, uh, you know uh, storied uh, policy regime and it's just somehow 
uh, had a new effect because something in the economy changed, right? Um, we actually think that the original constitutional um, American uh, standard, which was actually to have temporary protection and with a very strong emphasis on temporary, was the right way to go. And what we've had is a distortion of that to where essentially now, certainly in copyright and to some degree in, uh, in patents, um, that temporary element that was so important for the uh, framers' original balance has been completely um, uh, turned on its head. So we have things like the Sonny Bono Copyright Act, which right. and, and was so, the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act, really. <laughs> so for copyrights, uh, so the idea is to encourage artistic innovation. Uh, it, it's uh, the the problem is that uh, that. Uh, the overwhelming majority of artistic creations don't make any money, uh, and yet they get made anyway, which means the overwhelming incentive for artistic creation isn't pecuniary, it's expressive. So uh, take away copyrights, and uh, people are still going to uh, make music and, and, uh, and make art. Uh, what copyright does is enable those very few jackpot winners that connect with the larger public uh, to be monetized by one business. So uh, if, uh, if it weren't the case, uh, uh, and there was a jackpot winner, uh, then you'd have uh, other actors coming in to produce new editions of that novel or, or whatever. Uh, the first, uh, the initial publisher would have first mover advantages, but but clearly would not be able to monopolize those gains for decades and decades and produce cash cows like like Disney's vault. Um, so. Uh, now that you have this regime that uh, where you've uh, got high fixed costs to find the next jackpot winner, but then enormous returns that you can milk for decades, that's very conducive to huge uh, uh, scale. Uh, so you have, unsurprisingly, in the entertainment industry, lots of conglomeration uh, of uh, to, uh, to and concentration as these enormous media enterprises are d basically designed to to maximize profits in this monopolistic regime. Although, although Steve uh, endorsed the. Classic. I think it was fourteen years copyright originally. Well, seven plus seven. Seven oh, plus seven. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, but uh, so as of nineteen seventy six, uh, when uh, the uh, the uh, it had migrated up to twenty eight plus twenty eight. Uh, but then nineteen seventy six went from to life of the author plus fifty years, and then with uh, Sonny Bono, life of the author plus seventy years. Uh, that extension was then done retrospectively, which is just makes a joke out of the idea that this is incentivizing prospective artistic creation because you can't incentivize artistic creations that have already been done. Uh, but it was just a straight up wealth transfer to Walt Disney and, and others. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, uh, even if it's uh, just kind of a sideshow or irrelevant to the supposed uh, subject matter, artistic creation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this uh, legal uh, discrimination against and hostility to copying uh, poses real problems for the internet, which is the greatest uh, mechanism for copying and disseminating information ever invented. Um, and so at various points, uh, there are tensions between copyright law and internet development. Um, every time you forward in, so now copyright extends, uh, not only has the terms been extended, but it applies to unpublished works. It, uh, you don't have to register your copyright like you did in the old days. Uh, so it applies to everything that's written. Uh, so every time you forward a friend's email, you are uh, doing, an, uh, you know, you're infringing uh, copyright material and are subject to po possibly $150,000 fine. Um, so with that kind of, uh, of sort of Damocles hanging over everything the internet does, uh, then we're getting a lot less out of, uh, of this, mac this magnificent mechanism for sharing information than we could. Uh, there's great gobs of, uh, of information in the vaults of, of uh, BBC and movie studios and th that's uh, the so-called orphan works uh, that uh, they're, they're material that could be, uh, could be uh, distributed, but we don't even know who owns it. Uh, so we can't ask permission. And so it just sits there in molders. Uh, so but it seems... So like – and, uh, you know, we have the possibility with Google Books of just uh, reading every book that's ever been written right there at your laptop. Uh, uh, after 10 years of tortuous litigation, Google was finally able to get permission to, to do little snippets of all of the out of print but still copyrighted works which make up uh, still the majority of everything in print or everything that exists. Uh, so Google Books is a fraction of what it could be uh, in, a, in a more liberal regime. It seems that, that it's difficult to make an argument where you're trying to draw a line like seven years, 14 years, 28 years. It seems that you should either be no copyrights or it should be infinite. I, I mean, there, there's a pretty good case if there's a moral case for developing property. It's the same case as, as – Lockean appropriate, you know, I built a house, it's mine, and there's not like a 70-year 
you know, for 70 years, it'd be hard to justify that. So shouldn't we be having infinite copyright and then deal with the distributional effects if it's a form of property? Yeah, so I, I think the the uh, the name intellectual property is a marketing coup. It's right up there with death tax in, in terms of... Uh, of uh, Appropriation uh, of terms. Of setting the frames of debate yeah. in, a, in a favorable way. Uh, it could just as easily be called intellectual monopoly. Uh, um, uh, they both are, are you know, plausible, uh, but they have very different connotations. And intellectual property seems uh, very positive uh, that the uh, that the interests, uh, the copyright and patent interests, aren't uh, looking for special favors. They're just looking to have their property protected against piracy and thieves. Uh, so uh, that all puts them on the moral high ground. Uh, but I think the uh, to to. Th- Think of intellectual property as a natural extension of, of tangible property rights as a kind of category error. I think uh, uh, rights in uh, intangible property uh, or corporeal property, real or uh, movable, um, is necessitated by the existence of scarcity. So property uh, rights are a way of allocating uh, scarce goods. Property rights tend to emerge uh, when uh, when just using using a commons starts producing conflicts and then people have to allocate who, what belongs to whom. Uh, but uh, intellectual property doesn't do that at all. It's not allocating scarcity. It's creating scarcity out of nothing. Uh, you have uh, complete non-scarcity. Uh, so my using an idea affects your ability to use that idea zero. In fact, it may make it more valuable to use that idea. Uh, so I think the idea, the, the, the analogy of intellectual property is a, is a bad one. Uh, so that you can, drugs? You, can make, drugs? You, you can make a policy argument for copyright. Uh, I, I don't think it's an argument that we that if we don't have uh, artistic expression, excuse me, if we don't have copyright, we're just you know, we're, we're going to lose all of our culture. I think that's a silly argument. Uh, but you can argue that it's just a good policy for artists and and writers to be able to make a living at doing what they do. A copyright regime can make that possible in a way that uh, that other legal regimes won't. If you think that's a worthwhile policy goal, then you can support a limited copy right law to that. That effect, but I think, I, just, I think the natural rights. If 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 the case for uh, intellectual property has to rise and fall in natural rights case, I think it falls. Well, pharmaceutical, but pharmaceuticals is it's just like doctors were the occupational licensing, uh, and you mention it in the book, but you don't really. Uh, although you take the do- the doctors on head on, you don't really take the drug patents on head on. Well, except I mean, we do make the point that um, if the argument for intellectual property here. Um, doesn't have a natural rights foundation, and we are pretty strongly believe it doesn't, then it, then the argument has to be utilitarian. And then you have to start thinking about what are alternative regulatory regimes, um, right? So intellectual property is one. Uh, prizes are another. That is, you can actually give people money on the front end, but then make the marginal cost essentially zero. There's lots of reasons you'd want to do that, especially if you care about the diffusion of innovation, right? You want people to use it. Um, you also want people to take it and to monkey with it and do new things with it. Um, the Our existing intellectual property regime both has a negative effect on diffusion and use, and it has a, a negative effect on recombination and innovation. Um, and so, again, the, the entire argument is uh, in there is simply which regime is going to get you the most um, uh, out of different, and I think the same thing is true in copyright. I think there's a good argument that uh, we're uh, to some degree facing a crisis um, in at least news production on that side um, because our copyright regime certainly doesn't seem to be helping to support that. Uh, but we haven't developed any other way to pay uh, artists or journalists or anybody else. Um, but those for us, I think, are all both utilitarian questions right, and they're questions about the dis- uh, the distribution of the benefits that are associated with different uh, regimes and they're unavoidable, they're, right? They're unavoidable questions about who do you want to actually uh, benefit and how do you uh, weigh that benefit versus whatever innovation you're going to get out of those different regulatory regimes. But to circle back to pharmaceuticals and, and address that harder case, uh, so the, the the consequentialist utilitarian argument for patents uh, is a market failure argument uh, that because uh, we're dealing with production of ideas and ideas you are not excludable, uh, then you're going to have underproduction of those ideas uh, because you don't get to internalize the, the benefits of what you've done. Uh, that argument seems to work the best for pharmaceuticals uh, and for chemicals. Uh, that is, the evidence that, the, that it encourages innovation in those fields is better than anywhere else. Um, and uh, that has to do, I think, with a couple of things. Uh, first, whenever uh, innovation is really, really costly and imitation is really, really easy, 
uh, then uh, the case for patents is stronger. Uh, so that's maybe one reason why recipes aren't patented. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's maybe hard to come up with a recipe, but imitating a great chef is you know easier said than done. Uh, so uh, uh, so. It, but in those regimes like uh, pharmaceuticals where uh, once you've got the chemical formula and you figured out how to make it, then just the producing it is, is fairly trivial, uh, then the case is, uh, is stronger. Secondly, uh, if you're going to have intellectual property, uh, it really helps to know what the boundaries are. You can't have any kind of viable uh, regime and tradable rights to anything unless you know what the boundaries of your rights are. Uh, in the case of chemical, chemicals and pharmaceuticals, those boundaries are very clear. They are delineated by chemical formulas. Uh, in the case of software patents or business method patents, which is where all the growth in patenting has been in recent decades, the scope of the patent is always defined by vague abstract language uh, whose exact contours can only be uh, determined through litigation. So uh, therefore, you have an intellectual property regime where nobody knows where the boundaries are, and that is legal chaos, which is where we are right now. I was just thinking about uh, the role that reputation might play in a world without uh, the into the IP regime we have now. Because you can think of industries like uh, I was thinking of stand-up comedy, right, where where actual the reputational cost of, of stealing a joke or something like that is really really high. Uh, and I was, you know, Trevor and I could um, type out your book and say buy Matthew Feeney and Trevor Burris, but there would be a pretty significant reputational cost to that. It'd be very easy for you to prove that you know they were ideas original to you. Uh, and I suppose that's just a way of me adding on that. I, I don't think the the horror show that some people outline is necessary. Yeah, <laughs> again, the I, again, we're not uh, intellectual property abolitionists, but I think it's worth thinking through a world without intellectual property uh, to, to see that really the sky wouldn't fall. Uh, and, and so that these horror stories told by pharmaceutical and record industry lobbyists, that if you uh, just make the slightest marginal uh, uh, tinkering in any of these laws that uh, that the American culture and American uh, innovation are just going to collapse uh, are just the you know, self-serving garbage that they really are. <laughs> right. And I think the uh, the important thing to recognize is the uh, the argument that you've got a market failure does not necessarily necessitate an intellectual property response. There's multiple different ways you can deal with that, right? And even if you decide you have an intellectual property response that underspecifies how uh, how big the subsidy or bear, essentially barred entry you want to have um, is, and you uh, you always want to put that at the lowest level feasible for what's going to get you the outcome you want. So um, it's very important to not go immediately from the idea that there's some kind of market failure all the way to the idea that our current legal regime is awesome and is in, in, inevitable and is the only one you can get that will actually uh, keep medical innovation from cratering. And it's worth mentioning that even though the case in principle for pharmaceutical patents is pretty strong, the case for the actual status quo of uh, of, of, uh, of patent law for pharmaceuticals today is is more contestable. Uh, there is good evidence that uh, patent pro that pharmaceutical producers uh, do a lot of gaming of the system to make cosmetic changes in products just to extend patent lives. So if if patent law is incentivizing that kind of uh, of of behavior rather than actual producing uh, the you know, new drugs that are going to save people's lives, uh, that suggests that uh, patent law is not all that it could be and is in need of some kind of uh, uh, tinkering. Now, the other, the other, the fourth, we've touched on, we touched on finance, we mentioned zoning a little bit with the m m mini houses, and, and that's the one I think we should get a little bit more into on housing and how bad it is. Uh, people probably know that San Francisco is expensive and New York City is expensive and Washington, D.C. is expensive, but it's much worse than that in terms of how much it's stifling. So awareness of the consequences of zoning has really taken off in the last few years. Uh, before that, this was zoning's been around for a hundred years. It's been endemic for a long time. Uh, just the zoning of America occurred uh, in step with the suburbanization of America. Uh, uh, but uh, it has become clear in recent years that this very local uh, kind of policymaking that occurs in these thousands of, of jurisdictions is aggregating up into big national consequences, especially uh, the, the land use regulation that's occurring on the, uh, the coasts. So uh, what has happened in recent years is that – so always the purpose of zoning was to uh, – was to uh, uh, influence where within a metropolitan area uh, 
uh, building occurred, uh, but uh, its purpose was not to influence uh, the overall volume of housing within a metropolitan area. Uh, but in recent decades, uh, due to increasing uh, restrictiveness and due to the running out of sprawl room on the coasts uh, when you run into the water, um, you're seeing uh, – uh, that the actual total quantity of housing is being influenced uh, by uh, by zoning, and so the responsiveness of uh, housing supply to housing demand uh, is is diminishing. And what is so when in recent years, when there has been this kind of urban renaissance, and and there has been new economic dynamism in cities, and uh, high highly paid and highly skilled professionals have been moving back to cities, uh, there is a big demand uh, for living in cities now. Uh, at the very same time, those coastal cities have been uh, ratcheting up their land use regulation, making housing hard, new housing harder and harder to build, so that uh, that demand to live there is just translating into higher prices rather than into more units of housing. Uh, so uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, Ed Glazer, an economist at Harvard, calculates about 20 percent of the price of, a, of, of housing prices is a regulatory tax. It's, due to, it's the, You're paying for the permission to build. Uh, in L.A. and Oakland, uh, the, re, the regulatory tax is 30 percent, San Francisco, San San Jose, Manhattan, it's 50 percent. So people tend to think that this is just completely supply and demand. Uh, you know, San Francisco and New York, great places to live. They're not making any new land. This is just natural. Uh, but it's not. Uh, half of it's not natural. Right. Anybody, I, I remember I um, I was doing some research in the peninsula in, in San Francisco and had to go down to the Packard Foundation, which is in Los Altos, California. I took the train down, right? Very expensive, fixed piece of infrastructure. You get off of the train station in Los Altos, and there's like a 7-Eleven. And nothing, right? I mean, this enormously imp valuable piece of property, right, which you could fill up with enormous concentrated um, uh, housing that would be able to send people into San Francisco, right, is completely under uh, underutilized. Um, and so that's problematic, both for the general reasons we've been talking about, but it also means that you're under um, exploiting that public investment that you put all that all that resources into. So that's one of the dynamics here. I think the other thing that this uh, shows and the example that Brink talked about shows is how many of the cases we're talking about, what protects these pathological policy regimes is the degree to which people just uh, assume that the status quo policy uh, is just obvious, right? Uh, oh, of course you should have zoning, right? If you didn't have zoning, then everybody would be living next to a smelter, right? That would be that would be awful. Or in the case of, um, of uh, medical licensing, oh, if you don't have that, then you'll have, you know, quack doctors, you know. Um, and that's all in a way uh, that goes back to, to a question you asked earlier about the political conditions that create this regime, right? They are produced by uh, – economic monopoly is produced by po political monopoly, right? Um, that is, the people who support the existing regime are benefited most by the fact that it seems natural, that it seems obvious, um, that – Arguments against it are, see, are seen as what Jack Balkan called off the wall, right? Simply so crazy as not even to need to be argued uh, against, right? And so the thing that destabilizes these things and often makes them less um, sturdy than standard public choice analysis would suggest um, is simply that that absence of counter argument, right? Uh, the absence of anything that would denaturalize these policy regimes and make them seem not obvious, right? Make them uh, seem like they have to be subject to being argued for, um, and that's where the uh, the market for ideas matters, right? Uh, the market for ideas both produced by outside uh, actors, right, who can make these uh, these arguments. Part of the argument for make, writing this book, right, is to take some of these things that in some areas are seen as out you know, off the wall or out of the out of the mainstream, and say, no, these are you know perfectly logical, natural, non-crazy arguments that ordinary people can make in licensing boards and local uh, town councils. Those ideas, therefore, have an effect on organization. Right? People don't even organize often around things that they view as um, if they think that they're going to make them uh, sound like a crank or sound like a nut. Um, and so one of the things, therefore, that can very rapidly change, and you think you're seeing this in California, right, uh, ideas about the effects of zoning. This is one thing where I think ideas really have mattered, right? Young people uh, often, you know, who are creating these YIMBY or these Yes in My Backyard organizations, and part are organizing because um, people did the research, right? They created a meme, um, an idea, right, that can spread uh, in, in that particular way. 
And that, I think, is part of the uh, the secret to how some of these seemingly um, unstoppable or inevitable or hegemonic uh, policy regimes can very quickly uh, crumble if there's the resources put into undermining their, um, their intellectual justification. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.